I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, where I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the applied science and bewitchery of brand and business storytelling, so that you can clarify your story to amplify your impact and simplify your life. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. As a brand communicator, have you ever had a viral hit? That's the holy grail for all content marketers, wouldn't you agree? But it's hard even seemingly impossible at times. Many social media mavens profess you have to have the right content in the right place at the right time for the right people catching the attention of the right influencers with a heaping helping of, well, luck. But what if there was a proven story structure that's been around for ages that could increase the odds of your message becoming a mega hit? at least in social media terms. Our guest today believes he's quantitatively found the secret to making your content contagious. Some will dismiss this episode saying there is no magical viral formula, but can drama outwit dumb luck in making your information infectious? Keith Quisenberry is a former creative director and now an associate professor of marketing at Messiah College. His research interests include social media marketing and storytelling in integrated marketing communications. He wrote the book, Social Media Strategy, Marketing, Advertising, and Public Relations in the Consumer Revolution. And he shares his storytelling and social media findings on his blog at postcontrolmarketing.com. Keith, with his co-researcher, Michael Coulson, have recently published a two-year study on what makes content go viral. It's called Drama Goes Viral, Effective Story Development on Shares and Views of Online Advertising Videos. And he's here today to reveal a story formula that seems to win the day on the interwebs. So let's get started right now with Keith Quisenberry on this edition of The Business of Story. Keith, welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's been a while, but I'm happy to join you again and share some findings. Well, I'm happy that you're here too, because you were on show number 12 of the Business of Story. That was about four years ago. So I'm glad I'm still up and running and broadcasting to have you back. You know, in that show was so fascinating to me because I had read your studies and and followed your research way back when on Super Bowl advertising and what made for a good Super Bowl spot and what were the ones that really paid off for their brands. And of course, through your research, you found storytelling being at the heart of it. But now you and your colleague have gone out and done a second study on this, I guess kind of the next round of this, looking at virality on digital realm. How do videos in particular, I guess, go viral? And is it luck or is it science? Or maybe a little bit of combination of both. I guess that's what we'll be discussing today. So welcome back to the show. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you're still around as well as providing some great research and insights into story. It's, it's definitely what's moving business today. So Well, it's, I just have found it so fascinating. And this is what, show number 218 or something? I don't have it right in front of me, but yeah, 200 shows later. Great having you back. And want to talk, just for those that haven't heard you, your first episode over four years ago, can you give us a quick overview of that initial study that you guys did, what you were trying to achieve with it or find with it, and, and what was the outcome from it? Yeah, basically, you know, my background is I was an advertising creative. And when I first entered academia and started doing research, I looked around at the access to data I had, and I knew Super Bowl ads, I knew TV ads. So we collected two years 
worth of Super Bowl ads and we looked at the results from Super Bowl ad rating polls like USA Today Ad Meter and we coded those 60 some TV spots over the two years for five act dramatic form based on Freytag's pyramid. And what we found was that the more acts that you told going towards a more fully developed story, the greater the likability of the ad, or in other words, your Super Bowl spot would rate higher in the polls. If you told a complete story, you were more likely to be in the top 10. If you told no story, had no story developed at all, you would be like in, in the bottom of the polls. And again, could you just explain what the free tag pyramid is so our listeners can understand, put this all in context because it had a big impact on your recent study as well? Yeah, that's kind of the framework for, for both studies. Yeah, it's kind of the classical drama model first conceived by Aristotle in, in three forms, but then it was kind of advanced by Gustav Freytag when he was trying to describe plays in in terms of, you know, more specifically, you can think of like a Shakespearean play that that you possibly learned about in, in school. You know, it's it's told in five acts. You know, the, the first act is kind of act one is the introduction. You get the background and introduced to the characters. You understand the situation. And then usually there's an inciting moment that causes some conflict. And then that that leads to act two, which is the rising action as a result of that conflict. And then as the action's rising, there's usually this moment where it all comes to a head. And then the main characters, there's this moment where they're either going to fail or they're going to succeed. And that's act three or the climax. And then the result of that main event are the falling actions. Did they succeed or fail? And then what are the consequences of that? That's act four. And then usually at the very end, you hit act five called the resolution when the characters all work it out and they return to some sense of normalcy at the end of the story. And he, Gustav Freytag, created this. I've just looked him up right now online around 1863. So this Freytag pyramid has been a thing for a long time and have playwrights in Hollywood and other folks like that relied on it as much as say, you know, the hero's journey or other frameworks or where does this particular five act framework fall in the world of storytelling? Yeah, actually early screenwriters relied on the five five act form then there was kind of a move away for it to more of a three act form but then lately people are trying to argue to go back towards the five act form you know we just found that it just gives us a little more nuance to to the coding and we actually f- found significant differences between acts that you could see a difference moving from one act to the other and so what you did is looked at all of these videos you went i, I guess your first indicator was to go on and see which one had millions of views or so forth. I mean, how did you decide on what videos you were then going to review and how did you arrive at if they were one act to five act pieces? Yeah, that's a good question. Cause, uh, yeah, I, I worked with my colleague, Michael Colson, and he's, he's a, a, another marketing professor. We couldn't do this on our own, obviously. So we partnered with the video ad company called Unruly, and their job is, is collecting data on brand videos. And what they did is they provided us a, a data set, and they, they collected a random sample of videos from a year period. And then from that, we we did a, ran, uh, a random sampling technique ourselves, and we got it down to roughly 200 videos, and we pulled out some videos that that are typical formats that that normally, like uh, movie trailers, they're usually just clips of the movie, or some some videos are just sports highlights. We pulled those out, and we were left with 155 videos, and then we trained two independent coders, which were grad students on how to recognize the different acts. And they went through and watched all 155 videos and coded them for us. And so they got a sense, you literally had someone pulling out if this was a one act, two act or five act piece, is there a margin of error in there? Or did they get to the point that they were really good and they could see? Because sometimes, as you mentioned, nuance is such a big part of it that an act 
can slip by. I mean, how did, how did you make sure that they really had that dialed in? Yeah. So, you know, through the training, we, we did, uh, we did some sample videos and had them do them independently. Then we pulled them together and kind of talked through the nuances. But then when we actually did the, the 155, they did them separate, all of them separately. And then I went through and I looked at, you know, which ones did they pretty much agree on and which ones were their significant differences. And then we went back and had a meeting with them and talked through the ones that they, they really disagreed about and came to a consensus after that meeting to kind of make sure that we were pretty accurate in that coding. Gotcha. And so did you yourself have to look at all those videos as well? I did. I did. I actually, because I had to, I had to actually provide them the links on YouTube so that they could watch them. So pretty much uh, most of those videos I had, had, I looked (laughs) through myself. So let's forget the structure for just a minute. And after all this, be just embedding yourself into this research, looking at those videos, was there a theme or a surprising trend that you saw, whether it be plots or content or whatever, forget the acts, that, that seemed to play through, that was kind of like a social norm in some of these very popular viral videos? You know, the surprising thing is that telling a story really does, you know, and, you know, we, we looked at the, the numbers and made sure that statistically there is a significant difference. Telling a story makes a difference in terms of shares and views. So those are the things that we actually measured to determine that it was something that was more viral. So anything that that told a story, specifically if you reached Act 3 and 4, that's where we saw a big jump in shares and views. The the telling Acts 1 through 3, they were all kind of flat. And then if you get to at least after the climax – to act four and you deliver the resolution, that's, that's where you get the most shares and views. And honestly, we had videos that were maybe 30 seconds long, like a traditional TV ad. And we had some that were 20 minutes long and it didn't really matter how long or short it was. It, the difference was telling the story. The other thing that we measured for, which was very interesting is we, we wanted to, to see if, a company that has a larger potential budget could kind of buy their way into getting more shares and views, so to speak. So we looked at all the companies that that ran the ads and we looked at their total revenue and we compared that to the increased shares and views and we found that there was no connection there whatsoever. So a small nonprofit with, with a, a, a small yearly budget could tell a 5 act story and get more shares and views than a Fortune 100 company that potentially could have spent a lot of money on the video. So the media budget didn't matter, you found? No, no. These were all, we didn't have access to the actual, you know, yeah. production budgets, but we, you know, we were just kind of going by, if you're a larger company, you have access to more resources, but yeah, that was, so it's, it's kind of like a level playing field and and that's a good news for, for smaller businesses. It is because at the beginning of your, your report, by the way, it's called drama goes viral effects of story development on shares and views of online advertising videos. You say right up top about how the ad spend is changing so dramatically. And I'm just going to read directly from this in 2018 advertisers spent more than $10 million on brand digital and mobile video, a 53% increase from just two years earlier, 2016. Two-thirds shifted funds from traditional TV budgets into digital video advertising. As of 2018, online advertising spending surpassed TV advertising spending by $30 billion. I mean, that's amazing. And yet what you're saying right there is to hack that spend is to simply come out with a better story. Yeah, and and this this was the other surprising thing that we found was this is a huge missed opportunity. So our sample included 155 viral brand videos randomly selected, and I should say that they were all they were English language videos from the U.S., the U.K., and Australia. So we did have kind of a, a global sample of those 155 viral brand videos only 25% were fully developed five-act stories. 
So three fourths of the videos that are out there aren't aren't telling full stories. And actually, 31% were coded as no story, zero acts, which is like, you know, there's, there's nothing going on there whatsoever. Yet they went viral for some reason. No, they didn't. Oh, they didn't. Okay. No, no, no. Those are the ones that, that didn't perform well. But the, the, the interesting fact is 66% of the videos only contain zero to three acts, but on average, our four and five act videos gain more than four times the shares of zero to three act videos. So if you tell a story, like if you, if you have a video, it has four or five acts, you're going to get four times the amount of shares than zero to three act videos, yet 66% of all the videos that we coded were zero to three acts. So how did, in doing this, and I know your love of the, the Freytag pyramid and what you found in the past with, it, with your Super Bowl ads, did you have any fear of any sort of confirmation bias going in that you were like trying to proof this out or did it just kind of prove itself out to you? Honestly, it, it proved itself out because we, honestly, we had no idea whether this was going to work on YouTube with, with viral ad videos. Mm -hmm. You know, it was... And actually, when we went in to do the Super Bowl ad commercials, honestly, I like I literally had a dream about it. I woke up in the middle of the night because I was I was trying to do research and I wanted to research Super Bowl ads, but I didn't know what to research on. And I woke up in the middle of the light and and wrote down five act Shakespearean play, like it just popped in my head. And then I did some research and I found Freytag's pyramid. And we said, let's just take a shot at it. Let's code and see if it holds up. And it held up for the Super Bowl ads. So we went into this the same way. And we're like, I don't, we don't know if it's going to hold up. And we actually, we used different grad students. We didn't even use the same grad students. And they didn't, they weren't involved in our research previous to this. So we didn't go in like, you know, they didn't know exactly what we were trying to prove. We just had them have them encoded for us. Hmm. Interesting. So what is the definition of a viral video? I mean, how many hits does it have to have and what in X amount of time or where, what defines that? Yeah, the, the, the actual academic definition doesn't, doesn't really define a specific amount, but it's basically something that gets shared and spread on a large scale within a short time period. So the idea is it's 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 something that's that's going to build awareness for your brand and get you some some so-called free exposure, and that's the difference between you know like traditional advertising where you're paying you know you're paying for those views when you're interrupting them during a program, and that's the other interesting thing about like a YouTube video, people that are watching these even though they're they're ads they're they're brought to you by a brand people are voluntarily choosing to watch them, interact with them and share them to others. Where when you run a TV ad, it's, you know, they're there to watch the main program and you're interrupting them with your TV ad. So that's kind of the other difference between viral ads and, and traditional, you know, mass media advertising. And I was reading through your notes here, so maybe I missed it, but did you say, or in here I saw that, you look at something that happens within 23 days of airing to see how viral it is, and that helps put you into that category of being viral? Yes, that, that was something that was shared to us by the viral ad video company Unruly. In their experience collecting millions and millions of, of video and the data behind it, they found that, that most videos experience half their total views within the first 23 days after the video is released. So when we went through this and we were measuring, you know, views and shares, we were looking at that 23 day period. So yeah, that's a way you could, you could define viral as something that achieved a certain number of views and shares within 23 days. So despite the, the five act structure, what's in your mind's eye from your research goes into creating a viral video? What are you, what are you doing within those five acts that seem to be consistent in helping these videos go viral? Yeah, that, that was another thing that 
that we did is beyond just conducting our own research, we went and, and did a review of existing research out there to, to add some more meaning to, to our findings. And there's a couple things that we found. Some, some previous research has found that the amount of branding in a viral ad does not actually deter sharing. So you don't have to be afraid if you're a brand and you're creating the video and you, you want it to, to be shared and viewed. You don't have to be afraid of like putting your brand name in there and letting people know it's, it's from your company. But they did find, other research has found that if, if awareness of per persuasion happens, it has negative influence. And the way to think about that is how much are you pushing a direct sales message? So it's okay to have branding in the video, but if you're too much of a typical ad and you're you have a, a high, you know, a high uh, amount of uh, uh, that sales message, then that's going to deter, have a negative influence on on the person viewing and sharing this the spot. And to me, that kind of that's an, also a confirmation of telling a story. Like people love stories; they don't want this sales pitch. And so I guess that would be one test of your production would be, am I telling or am I selling? And if it looks yeah. like you're pushing ah, yeah. too hard, then that persuasion, that overt persuasion, your audience is going to pick up. And they might not even pick it up overtly. They might just innately feel like they're being sold something versus if you're sharing and telling a story, you're taking them, transporting them along on the journey. Exactly. Yeah. And other, re other research has found that when the actors in the story that you're telling match your target audience, there's stronger social connections happen there. So it's about telling a story, but then, you know, the story you're telling should be related to the life of your target audience, which kind of which makes sense. Uh, empathy, sympathy, all playing a part of that so that they say your, your protagonist is just like me. I'm living vicariously through that story. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and, you know, it, it even breaks down to some studies, the, the more empathy you have, the more you can put yourself into the situation and you actually feel the tension of the story. And I mean, you probably, you know, this by watching like your favorite movies and, and those kind of things, you actually feel the tension that's happening in the story and it releases Oxycontin in your your in, in your body. Oxycontin, not oxycontin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah, oxytocin. That's yeah, yeah, that's what you're trying. No, no, you don't want that. In your body. <laughs> yeah, and then that that actually influences your behavior. There was a study where uh, you you actually could relate to the people in the story, and you had those feelings. The researchers found that there were increase in, in donations for a nonprofit after watching those videos. Yeah, Dr. Paul Zach's work. Yes, exactly. Paul Zach's yeah. work. And I'm happy to tell you, he was on the show exactly six weeks before you. He was my show number six. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to use that to help plug my four years in business. <laughs> yeah, I reference his research in, in our study. Well, and it's interesting. So you're talking about that oxytocin and what it does. And one of the studies that you mentioned in here, and I can't even begin to pronounce the name other than Clements was the third one that I can actually say. They talk about trying to find awe or create awe and affection emotions experienced in a viral video. So I get the affection side of it, you know, connecting with them that way. And I think that's where that oxytocin may be released. What do they mean by awe? Yeah. Awe is, it's that, it's that feeling of high arousal emotions. So, you know, obviously stories, can make you make you feel uh, certain emotions, but certain research has found that specific emotions are more effective. Emotions of astonishment, acceleration. When you hit those those more intense awe emotions, it's going to produce more shares and views in in the videos within the stories. So because because you can tell. It, it's 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 one thing to know, like, oh, yeah, I have to tell a story and it should be based on characters and my target audience. But then more than that, you get into these details of we should tap into certain emotions. And the more we tap into those emotions, like um, astonishment, exhilaration, inspiration, humor, even then, you know, those are the ones that that even motivate the behavior to a higher level. 
Yeah, I, I was going to say, it seems, to, at least in my world, in Park's world, humor is what gets me to share something. If I see something that just makes me, you know, bust out laughing, I'm like, oh my God, you got to check this out. Oh, yeah. So that might be an example of the awe you're talking about. It's not like, oh, you're looking at, uh, you know, a sunrise. It's just any sort of major emotion that is somewhat overwhelming. Yeah. When you, when you see, when you realize a funny situation, you get that you get that moment of awe, like you put the, you put it together and it makes you laugh or you get the awe of like an exhilaration of, 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 you know, accomplishing something. It's, it's just a high arousal emotion. Yeah. What is in your research, maybe you found this, what is the percentage chance of a video going viral? The percentage chance of a video going viral. I, do, am I like one in a thousand chances of that happening? One in 10,000? I, I would redefine, and this, this is something that I, that I've been working on a lot and thinking about, cause I, I teach like, uh, I teach social media marketing and I think you have to not, your goal shouldn't be to go viral in terms of the exceptions to the rule where you get, you know, a hundred million views and your Guinness book of world records for the most viral video. I don't think that's the goal. I think your goal should be to reach a significant amount of your target audience, which is probably a pretty a smaller niche audience among a certain amount of people that are most likely to want to buy your certain product or service. And, and you, should, you should view it that way in terms of getting or, or reaching the influencers within that group and that target audience. And then once when they spread it, they're going to reach – that group for you. I don't, I don't think the bar should be, you know, 60 million views or, or whatever you think that is, but, you know, just based by, based on the, the number of videos we coded that only, only 25% of the, the marketers out there are creating full stories. So I think you're just, you're miss there's, there's hits out there that, that people are missing out on because, because they're not following this. Okay. I want to come back to that in a minute because I want to explore something else, but don't let me forget. I want to talk about the challenge and the nuance that goes into creating full stories. But let me step to the side. Have you read this book, Hitmakers, How to Succeed in an Age of Distraction by Derek Thompson? I did. I read it this summer. I loved it. I just, and I keep going back to it. I think it came out about two years ago. Yes. And he studies what makes things go viral. And it's not just digital. It's, it's across the board. How does something take off? And I was rereading it yesterday on my way back from Seattle because I didn't have anything else to read. And I pulled it up and I was just you know, so fascinated by it. And I thought it was really uh, appropriate for our conversation here because in your research, essentially, you were laying out how you could have as an advertiser, marketer, creative, a greater probability of, if not going viral, having a whole ton more shares than what you might normally be doing if you're not intentionally telling a story. In the book, Derek Thompson, you might remember him interviewing the network scientist Duncan Watts, Mm -hmm. and he's not a believer in story, which made for a really interesting chapter in his book uh, because he says it's all math. And he talks about luck and math and making sure that you are hitting two kinds of audiences as he separates them out in the categories. There's vulnerability. He likes to measure, meaning are they vulnerable to your message? You know, are they open to your message? Are they someone who will react to your message? And then the second one is density. Are there enough of them? that if they're sharing across the board that he says you need to first and foremost fundamentally have these two dynamics of vulnerability and density available to you before anything would remotely go viral. And he says, in that case, yes, it's your, your media buy or whatever. But talking about the media buy doesn't even make that big of an impact, as you said earlier and you found in your research, it was the story. His findings are suggesting that you can do all the storytelling you want, but unless you get really super lucky in finding those that are vulnerable to the message and will react to it, and they are connected to enough people, they have a dense enough population that without that, the sharing's not going to happen and the virality is not going to happen. Yeah, I, I think what you're hitting on there goes back to having a solid business plan or marketing plan before you even get to storytelling. You need to have a well-defined value proposition to a well-defined niche target audience. 
And if you do your consumer research great in that process, then when you create the story, it's going to be the story that's you know, how his terms are someone's vulnerable to it. They're open to hearing the story and you're going to have that, that, that group that cares about your product or service specifically. And then, and, and then that kind of goes back to the definition of a viral hit. That means that group may be, you know, a hundred thousand people, but you know, you don't need to sell to 500 million people you need if you reach that core group your business could be successful so yeah i i i see what you're saying with that but i think again we're kind of going to the things that have to happen before you get to creating the stories yeah you you are trying to get luckier by being well planned out well thought out as you say really understand your market have your unique value proposition totally dialed in so that they will be vulnerable to it and know where this audience is so that you can enhance its density and help them share it out to like-minded people. And then it's not just enough to come back with some flashy graphics or you know, Instagram stories, which really aren't stories. They're just a bunch of stuff being blasted at you. But come back with a well-thought-out, delivered, five-act, story structure or story in some structure. And in doing all of that, then you might up your chances, your luckiness in virality. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah, you have to know who you're targeting to create the story around those characters so that they have empathy and can relate to them and and produce the emotion. And then you'll get the results of them wanting to share it with like-minded people. It, it brings me back to, this is an old book, but I still teach it in my class. Digital marketing class is uh, Seth Godin's unleashing the idea virus. And he talks about, you know, finding your, finding your hive. What's that small group of people that care about what you care about and then reaching the influencers within that group, and then that's how your ideas spread. Isn't he amazing, yeah. Seth Godin? Yeah. And I go back to just like his early work because he was so far ahead of it. I mean, he was talking oh, about morality and unleashing viruses before digital was really the thing. You know, it's it's really quite incredible. Well, it, his latest book actually comes back to this topic. He just came out with "This Is Marketing." And the subtitle is, you can't be seen until you learn to see. Yeah. And his premise is like, you, you have to get out there and you have to listen and truly understand your audience in order to want to get to be seen in this new environment where the consumer has the control and they decide where to put their attention. We can't pay to interrupt them anymore. And it's kind of getting back to this whole concept of what we're talking about is finding the, the core group that would be passionate about what you offer, tell them the right story. They'll engage with it. They'll share it. You know, we have to redefine the the way we do things in marketing. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I have just seen within the last year of this show, more and more guests talking about that very point about just because you have this 24 seven, always on digital medium at your disposal it doesn't mean it's going to work for you until you really get back out there and you know press the flesh of your customers, look them in the eye, and ask them what in the world's going on in their life and how can you be a service to them. And it it's I don't know just again from my years of doing this, it seems like our senses have finally caught up to us that the digital realm is not the silver bullet for marketing. That you have to get back out there and just talk to people and be with them. Yeah, that I mean. That makes me think of the the Pepsi Kim Kardashian ad that they created that blew up against them because you know the one where they were trying to associating the the protests on the streets and yeah they everyone drinks Pepsi and they're all it, and the world's a better place was that Kim Kardashian or someone else another actress in- I thought it was Kim Kardashian. Regardless, I know the one you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they were, everyone was saying how tone deaf they were. Right. Because when I looked into it, I read that they didn't hire an outside agency. They kind of did it in-house. And I just envisioned them on the top floor of their corporate headquarters. And they didn't like get out and experience reality. And they just kind of came up with it in this in this bubble. So, yeah. As it was a, with 
uh, Kendall Jenner. Kendall That's Jenner. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. I know exactly the one you're talking yes. about. I would have confused him as well, but thanks. God, I have the interwebs in front of me and just pull it up again. Yep, that's the exact same thing. Well, in your um, research, what were two or three of the spots, the video, the viral videos that you felt really stood out, that, that rose above all the ones you were looking at that you felt like really hit home that our listeners might go and take a look at? Yeah, the, the one that, that really stands out to me, you know, actually connects both of the, the research that we did. And it's the always like a girl video. Oh, yeah. Is that the one, the hashtag like a girl? Hashtag, hashtag like a girl. Yes. When that was released, it drove uh, more than 90 million views. It was the number two viral video globally. And we coded it for being telling a five-act story. It was a full story. And what, what was interesting there is they released it on YouTube first as as a as a video and then it proved its success virally and then later they cut it down to a 30 second commercial and ran it on the super bowl so they were able to proof it out online first yes and see that this thing took off and resonated i would be curious to know how well that 30 second spot did versus the longer form video online that Oh, I see what you're comparing them. Yeah, if you start carving up that five act structure right. and you got to boil it down and still keep that nuance, is it as powerful? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if you could actually compare that because it it was already out there in the longer form. I do know that in the Super Bowl ad polls, when people were voting for their favorite Super Bowl commercials, that was at the top. So it did. It won out. It won out even in the thirty second version. What I would love from you now, see, I'm going to totally put you on the spot, is for you to write a blog post and say, here's how it worked online in your summation and how you, you know, mapped out the five-act structure in it. And here's why it worked, how you can actually cut down your, your long-form video to a 30-second spot and still, you know, give it that much punch. That would be kind of an interesting comparison. Yeah. No pressure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, in a backwards way, that's what our that's what our our first study proved is. Yeah, you can actually tell a full, complete five act story in thirty seconds, and then when we went to YouTube. We kind of proved that it could be longer as well. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, it's really really hard to do, and I want to get to that. That's what I was ultimately coming back to, but in one more minute. The first time I really watched a video go viral real time online is back in 2011. And our son, Parker, had been up at Burning Man and he and two of his buddies, Will Walsh and Teddy Saunders, created this video. And it was one of the first ones that was like produced at Burning Man and then brought outside the world of Burning Man. They put it online. It's called, Oh, the Places You'll Go at Burning Man. And they got uh, Dr. Seuss's book, of course. So there you've got story embedded into it. And they went and they shot all the crazies and the, and the freaks and the creators and all these different people, beautiful people of Burning Man. And each of them is telling a line or two in the book, sharing it. And they're sharing it in different situations and different scenes at Burning Man and that kind of thing. They shot it. They put it together. They did a really cool thing with the, the scoring of it. They sent it out. They crowdsourced the scoring and told people, we have zero budget, but here's what we're creating. Here's a two-minute trailer. And if you would like, you know, send in a score. Well, they did. They got a, a, a movie composer out of New York. I can't think of his name right now, who sent in the score. And they said, oh, this guy's fantastic. They built it out. Anyways, it was a beautiful production. And he said, Dad, we're launching it, you know, on Saturday. It was over the holidays. And so he posted it out there, and we watched it. Very proud, you know, brought a tear to my eye. And I just decided I was going to watch to see what happened. And it was just amazing. The views went up and up and up. And it wasn't 23 days I followed it, you know, for that amount of time. But for a long weekend, I watched them garner over a million hits. I think in the first 48 hours, they got a million hits. And the messages that came back that people were saying, you know, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Oh, I've always wanted to go to Burning Man. Oh, I was there. This captures it beautifully. You know, there were a few trolls that jumped on there. But when I started looking at that, and that was the very first experience I had. So story was innate to it. You know, because it was Dr. Seuss. For, oh, and by the way, they, they reached out to the Dr. Seuss Foundation and asked for permission 
to go ahead and post this. And they did give him permission, which was I thought was so cool. And it just took off. And now is at about, I don't know, almost 4 million hits. You know, in the, in the world of hits, it's not enormous, but it's pretty doggone good and still gets people commenting on it. But I think it goes back to, and I asked Parker, you know, I said, why do you think that this just took off the way he did? And I suppose it kind of comes back to what that Duncan Watts had said. People vulnerable to it, that these are people open to the story you know, of Burning Man. And really one of the first times they have gotten a glimpse inside the city, you know, whether they've been there or not. And then number two, the density. So you could tell that the vast majority of the people commenting on it and seeing it had, you know, were vulnerable to, to, to a Burning Man, but they were of like minds and they shared it. They found their tribe there and it has since taken off. People have done knockoffs of it. And one last part of this story is my wife and I were in Melbourne, Australia earlier this year for a story workshop and we were downtown in uh, one of the malls there that had this amazing Dr. Seuss store in it. And we walk in and these guys, two guys are kind of dressed up like Dr. Seuss characters. And uh, we were talking to uh, one of our friends that was with us and mentioned the, oh, the places you'll go, a Burning Man video. And the guy behind the counter says, oh, I know that video. How do you know it? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, our son was one of the co-directors, producers on it. And he goes, oh, my God, it brings a tear to my eye. I show it to all of my customers. But there again, then again, they have found their audience and probably the reason why that went so viral. It wasn't for everybody. It was for a core viewership that wanted to experience it and share it. So if you don't have Dr. Seuss on your side and you're a creative And you're trying to create this. It's hard enough to create three-act story structure because our brains just seem like they want to default back to simplicity and just, you know, give me some whistles and bells and make it creative and that'll be cool. But when you now are talking about five acts, doesn't that up the bar so high that very few people can pull that off or not? Is it really more accessible to us than many people might think? No, I don't don't think when I was a creative in an ad agency – you know, I, ha- I used to have to do this all the time and I didn't know about these kind of things and I would just randomly come up with a TV commercial or an idea. And sometimes it was a full 5X story and sometimes it wasn't. And then we'd see the results and we wonder why, well, you know, why did that ad do so much better than this other one? But now that I see the formula, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, when you're creating it, I, I think it's more of just something to keep in mind to make sure you're hitting these aspects of the story or you may skip one. So it's not like, okay, I need to devote, you know, a certain number of words or a certain number of lines to establish act one. And then I have to have that same amount in act two. And then I make sure I have a nice act three and a four and a five. When we code, one of the things that we do when, when we um, train the, the grad students on coding is, you know, you may have a very, very long act one, and then you hit act two and then act three and four, and they happen very quickly. A lot of ads will, will hit the climax, and then you could literally have act four and five happen within like a couple seconds. But they're still there because they're doing what those acts do. They're, it's the actions that happen because of the climax. And then you just put that neat little bow at the end that resolves the story. Um, so that's the way I think about it. It's It's not it doesn't make something that that you have to work harder at. It just, it makes sure you include the right ingredients, but the way you include those ingredients and which acts you play up can vary depending on what you're doing. Yeah. It's funny. I was smiling when you said that because I had the very same experience when we would run two ads in the same campaign and one of them would pull really well and the other one, not so much. And it wasn't until I studied storytelling that I go, oh my God, this has got story built into it. We innately told a story here where this other one was just kind of a creative barf job or whatever. I don't, I don't know. It just didn't have it you know, in it. And, and looking at that, that's one of the things that pushed me to say, well, what if we become intentional storytellers versus just relying on our innate ability? Because sometimes, a lot of times, that innate ability will fail us. We will get lazy. We'll default back to, let's, oh, let's just do something create, you know, creative and push it out there. But so what you're saying, it sounds like, is the same thing, is in this five-act you know, free tag structure, or if you're building out a three-act story or whatever, 
or using the hero's journey, which a lot of people do and I, I use in my work as well. It's not so much about the length of time in each one of these acts and they got to be exactly perfect. They're, they're not. They're not balanced. They're, there's no symmetry to it. Don't think in time, but think in content. Think that you need to have this element of the story in here at approximately this location of the story, but you're not wedded to a particular length for that element. It could happen in an edit. It could happen in a reaction. It could happen in a single line somebody says, and then you moved into the next act. Exactly, exactly. And and what it does is it, it gets us, I think it gets us off of sh- shiny new objects where there's a tendency in, in the advertising business to chase the latest trends and, you know, do a blue green transfer. And that's why the ad was successful or, Hey, a bunch of ads were very popular in the Super Bowl and they all had animals in it. So let's do an ad with an animal and, and we're chasing the wrong things. But if, if you're intentional about storytelling, it's, it's like, no, the story, this ancient thing that we're all drawn to is what makes the difference and craft the story the right story to the right group of people based on the values and the, the proposition of, of your brand, that's good, what's going to be most effective. You don't need to be chasing all these other things that just worked for the other brand with a different target audience for a different reason. So Keith, what has drawn you to story? You know, you were a successful creative director. You were creating stories and you're pushing them out on behalf of your clients and your brands. What was it about story that found you and pulled you into it to the point that you would do two very extensive studies on the power of story and branding and marketing, and you teach it now. What what do you think called you into that pursuit? Yeah, I, honestly, it was it was kind of having once I started teaching, I had to try to explain to students how I came up with my ideas. And and when I was doing it, I just honestly was doing it, and there wasn't much reflection on on why and how, and you know, I, there was just something that was happening there. And then when I had to was was forced to explain to students, that's when I started exploring. Well, you know what? I honestly don't know why I did it this way, and why this worked, and why this didn't. And that's when we we started delving into it. And you know, when we went into the study, the original study, we didn't know if it was going to work out. We thought, well, what if we find that the most popular Super Bowl ads were the ones that had animals in it, or they all used humor? But that wasn't the case. There were ads at the top that didn't have animals in it and ads at the top that weren't humorous. But the difference we found were story, and then I could start passing this along. And, you know, it's just there's so much pressure on marketers today to – to, to, to deliver results and anything like this that can help you, you know, I think it's just very valuable. Yeah, it is. It, it, storytelling in business and with branding is one of the most underutilized yet effective business assets any company has. And if you look at, you know, people will sometimes like me and say, well, what's the ROI of storytelling? Well, my God, we've had clients grow by 600%. I've had individuals say I went in and used a story on or for a client and walked out with $10,000 more in business just by using some of these techniques. And now you can point to what's the ROI of storytelling in virality. You can't promise anything going viral, but boy, you can look at it if you just put some of this effort in, understand your audience, have a compelling, unique value proposition, and then create stories, you know, five-act structure, have it appear in your work, you are going to have a much better shot. And even if it doesn't go viral, have a greater return on the time and money invested in that piece. And you have even suggested in the study and on today's show that you don't even need to have the millions or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to promote it online. As long as you've got that gold mine of a story structure and you're sharing a story, you're telling, you're not selling, you're avoiding persuasion, and you are trying to trigger emotion, humor, sympathy, empathy, whatever, just like we all, you know, just how we all communicate. Right. Yeah. And, and we didn't research this directly in, in, in our research, but previous research into telling stories and TV ads by other researchers have have found that when people that they were surveying watch TV ads with stories, 
they had a greater intent to purchase from that brand. So there, you know, you're even taking it further towards what's that ROI that, you know, telling a story leads to greater purchase intent. Yeah, totally makes sense. Final question for you. Again, going back to either your research or maybe your research has given you a broader perspective on this. Who are the brands you think out there, large or small, that are doing a pretty doggone good job telling stories online in the digital world? You know, an interesting one that was doing very well, but then kind of lost their way. And I think because they didn't realize that this was why why it was working why it was working <laughs> is budweiser yeah budweiser was dominant in the super bowl ads for years and years and years and then you know and even i i even wrote a blog post about this comparing the number of views of the 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 ads they created you know before the super bowl and and those kind of things and and it was all based on the clydesdales and if you look at all the clydesdale ads they created they were complete stories and we coded them actually because some of them were part of that two-year study we did they told complete 5x stories and then something happened the the one year they moved away from the from that and they started creating these videos were just about they were like um you know we're budweiser st louis and we're so many years old and it was just these really bragging videos about the brand and they weren't telling stories. And suddenly they dropped out of the top 10 in terms of the, the ad polls and likability of the videos. So it's just, it's just kind of a, a proof point of this thing of like so many people just, they don't know why sometimes they get a hit and why they don't. And, and we're finding its story. And, and, and if you're just aware of that, you can increase your chances of, of being successful. Hmm. And is there one brand out there you think that's doing it particularly well right now? You know, what's interesting is I think a lot of the upstart companies that like the ones that are relying on, on word of mouth to spread like um, Dollar Shave Club, Mm -hmm. right? Startup, they don't have the big budget of Gillette, but they're selling razors they if you look at their videos they're telling a story of you know you're a guy and you're tired of paying all this ex- expensive money for these razors why can't you just get a good razor at a good price it's delivered to your house you know and that's something that they they knew who they were targeting and they spoke to that person in a story that they could relate to and then the sales followed and and they you know they threatened a huge giant company Gillette who has now had to respond by changing their business model to and they're offering you know the the the, the deliver at home method as well so that's an example you know those were online videos that got shared um, spreading word of mouth for that company and I would be really interested to learn and if anybody out there knows who created those I'd love to have them on the show because the question Keith I would ask them is did they get lucky because they were innate storytellers and just knocked that out and and knocked it out of the park in doing so? Or did they intentionally approach it as a storyteller and using five act structure to tell that story? That's a, that's a good question that that I don't know the answer, but yeah, I know, I know they started, uh, they started with a good understanding of who they were were targeting they had a good good business plan and marketing plan from the beginning to reach a a small targeted group yeah i mean i don't know i i guess the 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 founding of of their company was based on a story that their target audience could relate to so maybe it came naturally maybe it was intentional i don't know they found a pain point and then they did a beautiful job hilarious job of pulling that off the production was terrific too without spending a fortune on it and of course they didn't have a fortune to spend on advertising exactly story won out right awesome Keith, thank you so much for being here. Where can people learn more about you and read through your most recent study? My blog is postcontrolmarketing.com. And that relates to the new era of social media where the consumer has control. And we need to think about marketing in, in a different way now. 
uh, the brands no longer do. So postcontrolmarketing.com. And can they download your research there? The actual academic study is, it's in a, it's in a trade journal, but I'm working on a, uh, no, it's, I mean, it's in an academic journal. I'm working on a trade piece right now that should be published soon where I kind of boil down the highlights of it. And I'll, I'll definitely post that on my blog when it's available. Yeah, definitely send us the links. We will include it in the show notes, whether it's on this, you know, when the show first comes out or we will add it later because I've been through the study and I find it really, really fascinating. I shared it with a couple of other story brand storytellers myself just to get their take on on your findings. So really great stuff. But um, yeah, thank you, Keith. And thank you all for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. Last question, Keith, do you have another study coming out anytime soon? Uh, or is this one exhausting enough that you're done? <laughs> no, no. Actually, we're working on, we have a study where we looked at the viral spread over time. And we're looking at, does telling a story preserve the spreading of the video over, over a time period? Because this study just looked at total views at a specific time you know, at a specific time and, and we collected it during that, that 23rd day. But did telling a story, if you look at the arc over time, th- does not telling a story drop off quickly? Like it may get a, 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 a lot of initial hits and shares, but then it drops off quickly. But then telling a story, perhaps there's, there's a slower decline. So does storytelling help ensure your online sustainability for your message? Exactly. Will it stick around longer? Right. Ah, interesting. Well, I can't wait to hear what you find there. Maybe we'll have you back on the show with that. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, man. And thank you all for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. If you like what you heard and you've got friends, family, colleagues, bosses, whoever, that maybe are questioning the power of story and want to get some more hardcore evidence on how it works in our lives, share this episode with them. Let them hear what Keith has to say about it and sharing his findings on how stories can help you become more viral. And of course, if I can help you do that exact same thing, visit me at Business of Story. I'm there to help you. I uh, am ready to consult, teach, coach, and speak to help you and your team craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And like Keith experienced and like I experienced, it's not enough to be an innate storyteller. But when you become an intentional one, you can put the bewitchery of story to work for you and yours. So thank you for listening. Join us again next Monday when we will have another amazing story artist here like Keith. And until then, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks so much for listening.